The Bad Batch second season is over, and I'm not really sure if I'm ready to talk about, you know, the implications of Plan 99 and how that affects the series going forward. So let's skirt around that very uncomfortable issue and uh, talk about the bombshell that was dropped at the summit on Iradu. So the show takes us to Iradu. It's a population center found in the Outer Rim, homeworld of the wonderful Tarkin family. The Tarkins were a big name on the planet and had been amongst the first pioneers to settle on Iradu. Will of Tarkin even governed the planet for a short period of time before the Clone Wars started. Now during the Clone Wars, Tarkin would be seen by Chancellor Palpatine as a problem solver. Palpatine would give Tarkin a task and a certain amount of power and the man would get the job done no matter what. These type of individuals are really important for authoritarian leaders who are actively working to destroy the many checks and balances that keep government functional. Instead of institutions, Palpatine has to rely on individuals like Tarkin he trusts. Tarkin basically is an extension of Palpatine and all of his powers. This was someone who could cut through bureaucratic tape and politics and deliver exactly what his chancellor and later on emperor would need. And so if you're meeting Tarkin, you're basically one person removed from the big dog, the big dog with a wrinkly scrotum face. During the Clone Wars, Tarkin would eventually be assigned to the Special Weapons Division. The Special Weapons Division fell under the Strategic Advisory Cell. These were organizations created by the Republic to expedite weapons projects that might be essential in determining the outcome of the war. When the Republic transitioned to the Empire, many of these weapons programs were transferred as well and Tarkin would be given more and more oversight and control of these individual programs. One of the most important projects within the Special Weapons Division was Project Starlight, AKA the Death Star program. This is why Director Orson Krennic is in the room during the Iradu Summit, as is General Hurst Ramaudi, a Clone Wars veteran and an infantry specialist. He's put together a plan to integrate the TK troopers into the galactic-wide security apparatus. Phased widespread deployment will ensure a secure military presence across all sectors. Ramoni believes in more traditional peacekeeping strategies. Uh, you know, these are strategies that are not really practical for the Empire, as Tarkin and Palpatine would later on learn. There's simply too many planets in the galaxy, too many Andors, Organas, and Porkins. Can't forget about Porkins and not enough soldiers and ships to oppress them all. Now, based on who's in attendance at this summit, you know, Krennic and his Death Star program, Ramoti and his TK Trooper deployment plan, it's pretty obvious that the point of the summit is to figure out a long-term strategy to ensure peace and stability in the Empire. We know that Tarkin believes that instilling fear into the hearts of the civilian populace will create obedience. This would be a central idea in his Tarkin doctrine and use of the Death Star. The TK Troopers would turn into stormtroopers and be deployed across the galaxy on pacification missions with varied success. But what about Dr. Hemlock? You know, this Jeremy Renner looking kind of guy who's actually played by Jimmy Simpson, who is one of the McBoyles from Sunny in Philadelphia, one of my favorite reality TV shows. Well, Dr. Hemlock was only introduced to us very recently, and he is the chief scientist of the Advanced Science Division. And he's been placed in charge of basically sorting through all of that Kaminoan technology seized by the Empire after Typica City was basically wiped off the surface of the planet. Once we fully unlock the secrets previously known only to the Kaminoans, we will ensure an enlightened society through their advanced technology and molecular alteration. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this one line of dialogue and it is uh, probably one of the most important things that happens in a very, you know, important two arc episode. Now, this explains to us what exactly Advanced Science Division is up to, why the Empire's kept Nala Se, and why they're after Omega, and why they're so interested in cloning technology, despite the fact that all the clones are getting decommissioned. Heck, this might even tie into, you know, why the Empire needs that adorable little baby Gogurt. So let's start with the background information first. When the Kaminoans were hired by the Sith to create the clone army of the Republic, they were known as kind of a boutique cloning operation. There were bigger, larger, faster, you know, cloning operations out there. But the Kaminoans were very discreet. They lived in a very isolated part of the galaxy and their skill in modifying the genetics of living beings was in a league of its own. Long ago, the Kaminoans faced an extinction crisis of their own when the ocean levels began to rise, covering most of the land on their planet. And so they had to go through a very difficult selective breeding process in order to save their own species. And there was a lot of genetic modification done to the Kaminoans as a result. And so what was a horrible necessity turned into a very useful skill that could create lucrative returns on the galactic market. 
dolphin. The quality of the clone troopers are a direct testament to the Kaminoan cloner's abilities. Mandalorian bounty hunter Jango Fett was chosen to be the template of this army, and he was chosen for his combat instincts and physicality. But because Jango Fett was a wild and independent individual, the Kaminoans sought to dial down personality factors that were associated with independent thinking and aggression. Now, you couldn't just completely get rid of a clone's, you know, individuality and spirit. Without it, a clone will not show any initiative on the battlefield and would need to be micromanaged like a battle droid. And so the Kaminoans had a really difficult task set before them. They had a completely balanced the personality matrix, so you kind of had the best of both worlds. These clones needed to be aggressive and also unpredictable, but also controllable, stable, and loyal to their commanders. And these are obviously traits that are diametrically opposed to each other, and so I had to figure out a lot of different tricks to make it work. And judging by how well the clone troopers performed on the battlefield, well, that's just another testament to the Kaminoans' abilities. You know, despite all the recent propaganda about how, you know, dangerous the clones are, Palpatine still understands that the Kaminoans were second to none when it came to altering genetic information. And the Kaminoans were smart enough to never fully trust the Empire. Well, I mean, given their xenophobic nature, I don't think they trusted any other races. And given how their society was separated into castes, they didn't even really like each other or trust each other. They're just as toxic as real-life dolphins. And so one of the things the Kaminoans did was they actually made the clone troopers officially property of the Kaminoans that were on loan to the Republic. We found this out when the clone trooper Tup malfunctioned and kicked off a solo Order 66 months before it was supposed to happen. Every clone and their genetic makeup is property of the Kaminoan government. Now as a client of ours, I will respect your wishes. But as to the fate of this clone, I will speak to our Prime Minister, Lama Su. Now this kind of makes sense in a messed up way. These clones do have intellectual property inside of them. This is the result of decades of research. It's also clear that Nala Se has had her own special operation and created clones like the Bad Batch and Omega and potentially even Emery Carr on the side. And now it's clear that a lot of this technical data was completely hidden from the Republic and their Imperial clients as well, which actually wasn't that difficult to do. Remember, the Sith wanted the army to be created in complete secrecy, and so when the Jedi and the Republic arrived on Kamino to take over the clone army, they weren't actually involved in the design process at all. Instead, they just received a fully assembled product that was ready to deploy in a moment's notice. And now it's pretty clear that Dr. Hemlock, Tarkin, and Emperor Palpatine are very interested not in the cloning technology, the Kaminoans are using but their genetic alteration technology, which is a little bit different and just as ethically dangerous. Now, prior to creating the clone army, the Kaminoans had never worked with human DNA and physiology. This could be seen in their phase one clone armor design, which was extremely comfortable and built more for Kaminoan requirements than human limbs. And so a great deal of money from that first initial contract was spent on understanding how human genetics changes human personality. In Legends, you had the Null Arcs, which were amongst the first batch of prototypes. These were highly aggressive and unstable clones, and they were almost recycled into what I imagine would be protein paste. The clone commandos were a later batch that had less independence and were more stable mentally, but were still far more aggressive than your average clone trooper and probably not suitable for mass deployment. I'm assuming that this fine-tuning of the human psyche is what Emperor Palpatine really wants to get his hands on. It's not about cloning more workers and citizens for the Empire, it's actually about altering the existing people who already live in the Empire, which, again, has a lot of ethical, you know, problems tied to it. Now, we've talked a lot about this idea on our channel that people are genetically predisposed to be conservative or liberal, or at least lean towards one way or another. Open-mindedness and empathy are traits that more liberal-minded people have, and orderliness and justice are more conservative traits. Both groups are very necessary to counter each other in a balanced society. But let's say you're able to wipe out certain personality traits like openness and justice and replace it with more fear and anxiety. Well, I can see such a population embracing the empire as a much more natural choice of governance. This is social engineering combined with genetic engineering and it is terrifying. I mean, this is why evil Jeremy Renner wants to bring in a bunch of clone troopers and use them as test subjects. I'm guessing they'll try to make crosshair docile and obedient again using some type of machine that can alter a person's molecular structure. It's possible that it's even the same machine we see being used on crosshair in the first season. Deployed en masse, such genetic engineering could create a much more controllable and docile population, making the Empire's job a lot easier. You know, forget about Tarkin Doctor, forget about the Death Star, you won't need 
either of these things. But the whole concept is a little bit far-fetched. I think logistically, this would be a really challenging thing to do. I mean, people aren't just gonna sit there and let you alter their DNA. I, I think you'd have to, you know, trick them or trap them or force them somehow. But I do have to say, this is a very interesting take on the cloning technology. We know that Emperor Palpatine really wants to live forever and we see this in Legends and also in the sequels now. But this aspect of taking that cloning technology and focusing on the um, you know, molecular modification is a really interesting angle. So let me know in the comment section below what you think about my theory here. I do think this is what the Empire is going to attempt. I think they're gonna fail because we don't really hear about such a program in later shows, but who knows. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.